Grab your Bibles, turn to the book of Jeremiah. It's preaching time here at Calvary Baptist Church. And Jeremiah chapter number 17 is where we'll be this evening. Jeremiah chapter number 17. I'm always privileged and humbled when I get to stand behind the pulpit because I know that I, just like you, would rather hear pastor. I, I enjoy sitting and soaking and, and, and just gleaning from all the study that pastor does in the Word and never take it lightly that I get to stand behind the, his pulpit, not just his pulpit, but the pulpit that he built. And this is a beautiful, beautiful pulpit. doesn't seem like that long ago when we made it, but it's still just as gorgeous and beautiful as the day that it came out. And we'll make sure the lights are on, because last time I did forgot to do that. And it may not bug you, but it bugs me. So lights are on, we're good to go. Jeremiah chapter number 17. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Jeremiah. It's in there somewhere. You might have to skip a few books. Jeremiah, and this message, the Lord put on my heart probably a good three or four weeks ago. Three or four weeks ago, I didn't know that, um, that pastor would need the pulpit filled. Um, and so I just started studying, because usually when God gives you a message, he gives it to you for a certain time and a certain place. And he won't tell you the certain time and a certain place until he needs to put you right in that slot. So I started studying and the Lord blessed me really through this passage, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Jeremiah chapter number 17. And for sake of time, we'll just read two verses. Verses 7 and 8. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, starting in verse 7, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green. And shall not be careful in the, day, in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruits. This passage may remind you of another one. If you know your Bible or you've been around church for any length of time, you might instantly think of Psalm 1. You think of Psalm 1 because the blessed man is, is compared to as a tree planted by the rivers of water. Many of us have it memorized. And actually our school theme this year is even planted from that same passage of scripture, planted. But as I cross-referenced that at the beginning of the year, I, I stumbled upon this, uh, upon this passage over here in Jeremiah. And there was something in this passage that wasn't in the previous passage. I don't know if you caught it. The Bible says, and shall not see when heat cometh. Later on it says, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. For a few moments tonight, I'd just like to preach simply this thought, come what may. Come what may. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so very much for your word. We thank you for the way that your word speaks. Lord, it's a living book. It has something in, us, in it for us tonight. And Lord, I don't know exactly why you'd have this time and this place for this message, but Lord, you do. You knew who was going to be here. You knew who would need to hear it, both here and on live stream. So I pray, Lord, that you would bless the preaching of your word. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ tonight. That the world, world would not hear the voice of Caleb Kasperzak, but would hear the words of Christ. I pray, Lord, that everything done tonight will bring honor and glory to you. Help us, Lord, as we, as we study your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. Call me crazy, but I have always been fascinated with trees. Trees. Think about it. From when you were a little kid, you too were fascinated with trees. If you're anything like me, you were a tree climber. How many tree climbers did we have in here? When you were young, you loved to climb trees. Some of you still young and you still like to climb trees. You put your hands down. Like to climb trees? Someone, somewhere, that was a tree climber, I'm sure, came up with the wonderful idea of making a tree house and a tree fort. Let's not make, let's not make a fort or a house down here where it would be a lot easier, where it would be easier to pound all the nails, screw all the nails. Let's go up 20 feet in the air and hang precariously from these branches and screw in all these screws. Someone thought of that, and I bet you it was a tree climber. So, so I mean, even from, from a young age, you see a tree, and no one has to tell you. There was no tree climbing class in school. There was no, there was no uh, classroom that said, this is how you reach for the next branch and look for the next branch to climb. No one had that. You just did it because it looked fun and maybe a little dangerous. But climbing trees. It's, it's fascinating. You don't have to be taught to do it. It's just, it just kind of comes naturally. Building a tree fort. Some of you maybe even had the audacity to swing from a tree. 
Go figure. You put a swing, hang a tire to it or whatever, and you swing from a tree. You're still involved with a tree somehow or another. You live in houses made of trees. You sit on furniture made of trees, right on paper made of trees. Trees have an integral part of all of our lives, from when we were a kid all the way up till now. But it got me thinking about how many times that God uses trees in the Bible. Think about it. Right from the very beginning, when he created man and woman, Adam and Eve, he created them and put them in the Garden of Eden, a garden filled with trees. As a matter of fact, the very first act or rule of obedience that God gave them was they were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Trees must be kind of important to God, if that was the one rule. And then after they, were, they sinned and, and they were kicked out of the garden, God sent down cherubims to guard the tree of life. Another tree, just in the first three chapters of the Bible. But it doesn't start, stop there. In, in uh, Genesis 18, the Lord met with Abraham underneath a tree. In Exodus 15, Moses cast a tree into the bitter waters of Marah. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah had a juniper tree. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus had a sycamore tree. When in Matthew 21, Jesus cursed a fig tree that did not bear fruit. He entered into Jerusalem walking on the branches of a palm tree. He, he walked under the olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the cross of Christ, even, is referred to as a tree. Imagine that. Acts 5, 10, and 13, but all call the cross a tree. Trees are all throughout the Bible, and even beyond the places where it was a physical tree, a tree has been used as allegory or an example for the Christian life, for the godly life, for the carnal life in some cases, used as a tree. It made me wonder, why trees? God could have used anything. He could have used bushes. He could have used mountains. He could have, and certainly he did use those for other things. But why is the tree so important? By introduction, let me say this. The tree is, is so important because trees represent, number one, strength. They represent strength. The trees that you hear about during the, uh, the times when they are getting all the wood together for the tabernacle, the, the mighty, the cedars of Lebanon. A symbol of strength, a, a symbol of power, if you will. That tree, it was a strong tree. You see, it was a symbol of strength. Not only was it a symbol of strength, it was, a, it was to represent shelter as well. In Bible culture, in Bible times, it was not uncommon in the heat of the day for men, an army, people in general, to find shade and to find shelter under a tree. To find a place of rest under a tree. To find a place where they can just kick their feet up for a little bit in the shade of a tree. So it represents strength, it represents shelter, but I see thirdly, it represents substance. The wood of the tree has many uses. Wood was used to, to build Noah's Ark. Wood was used to build the tabernacle. Wood has been used all throughout the Bible times as those three things. A place, it, was, it was shelter, it was strength, and it was substance. But in this passage, I want to look at a specific tree. I want to look at the tree that's mentioned here in our passage. Now, this tree was a picture of the man or woman that placed their trust fully in the Lord. Placed their hope 100% in the Lord. But the tree was also a compare and contrast. Go back a couple verses. You see, the passage does not start right there. The Bible says in verse number 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. And maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord, for he shall be like the heath. Now, I gotta tell you, first time I've read this passage, no clue what a heath was. Call me crazy. I did, it's not the, not the sharpest bulb on the shelf, right? I didn't, didn't know what it was. I've, ha I've had heath bars, but I figured this wasn't the same thing. Figured it was a little different. So I did some research. And Brother Sasser might be able to set me straight on this one, but as far as I could tell, a heath is a small shrub, has wispy little branches, tiny little leaves, and it requires a few things. A heath requires plenty of water for growth. It requires good soil for which to be planted in, and it requires constant care to maintain its beauty. But look what it says about that heath. It shall be like a heath in the desert, not a good place to get some water. It shall be like a heath, not just in the desert, but shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land. You want good soil? Don't plant it in salt. 
Don't find yourself a salt flat and plant a heath there. It's not going to do very well. Not only was it in the desert, not only was it in the salt land, but not inhabited. The heath needs constant care. It's not going to get it when it's in an, an uninhabited place. So we see this picture contrasted from the tree that God desires his people to be. And I see here that not only is this a picture of what it's like for a heath, but it's a picture of a Christian life as well. You see, there are plenty of Christians that are trying to live their spiritual lives like a heath in the wilderness. They say, oh, well, I'm fine just getting by. I'm fine. You know, I'm, I'm still planted. I still have some life to me, but I don't really want to be so close to the river. I don't want to be so close to that place of nourishment. That seems a little restrictive. If you have to be near the river, I mean, it limits where you can be, so you'd have to be over here. Maybe I want to be over here, so, so I, don't, I don't necessarily want to be by the river. I can do just the bare minimum to get by. I can, I can just, just take or leave church whenever I want to. I can take or, or leave God's word. I can cut parts out that I don't like. You know, if it doesn't, I don't have to listen to all of it, obviously. I can, I can, I can do just my prayer life whenever it's convenient for me. That's the life of the heath in the wilderness. That's the heath. That is the dried up place where no water is. But tonight, I want to specifically look not at the heath. As Christians, we ought not to desire to be like the heath, but we ought to desire to be like that tree. And I notice a few things about this tree. First thing I notice is that it was a placed tree. This wasn't just any ordinary tree. This tree was placed on purpose. Look there at verse number 8. For he shall be as a tree planted by the water. Do you realize there was a purpose for someone coming along and putting that seed in the ground exactly where they did? They planted it there because they knew that if it was planted by the water, it would get nourishment all the days of its life. They knew if it was there, it would be healthy. If it was there, it would grow. If it was there, then it would have plenty of nutrients to last it its full life and help it to grow into a mighty tree. It wasn't there by accident. Someone specifically wanted that tree in that specific place. By the way, anything worthwhile doesn't happen by accident. You, you, have, you have a job that you go to. You didn't get that job by accident. At least I hope you didn't. You just wake up one morning. Yay, I work at McDonald's. Hallelujah. No interview whatsoever. Hallelujah. I'm, just have the job, right? It doesn't happen that way. You don't get a job by accident. You don't, your schooling or the schooling of your kids doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of work. takes a lot of hours. It takes a lot, of, a lot of purpose. The chores around your house, the things that just need to get done. You don't just snap your fingers and Mary Poppins comes in and everything gets cleaned up. You got to do it yourself. Take some planning. Take some purpose. It doesn't just happen. Things like that, your appointments that you keep, they don't happen by accident. They happen with purpose and planning. But why do we expect serving God to be any less? We, we some reason, live the rest of our life on purpose and we live our service to God flippantly. It makes no sense. We can't expect God and serving God to be any different. You see, the Bible talks about us serving God requiring that place in that time. It takes a place in time to keep us consistent prayer life. It takes a consistent place in time for our devotions every single day. It takes a consistent place in time to be winners of souls, to go out and to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It takes a consistent place in time to be faithful to church and faithful to God's house. It doesn't happen by accident. And you cannot live your Christian life and expect to be victorious if you take your Christian life flippantly. Aren't you glad that God doesn't take his love for you flippantly? Aren't you glad that he loves you on purpose? He didn't have to flippantly say, well, I might send my son to the earth to die for the sins of mankind, or I might not. I, I, might, I might create mankind, or I might not. I, I might intervene, I might answer prayers, I might not. That's not the way that God does us. So why do we do God that way? I'm talking about on purpose. The tree was a placed tree. It was planted in a specific place for a specific time and for a specific purpose. Can I tell you, you living here in Dundalk, Maryland or wherever in the area you live, you are here for a specific place for a specific time. No one could have even seen 2020 happening the way that it has. We could easily say, man, I wish I was in a different year. 
I wish I lived in a previous time. I wish I lived in, in this city, at this time, at this place. But God has you here. He has you here for a reason. He has you, if you're in the Christian school, can I tell you, he has you there for a reason. If he has you on a job site, he has you there for a reason. If he has you in a certain place at a certain time, he has you there for a reason. You are placed. It's not done by accident. It's done on purpose. The Bible says in Daniel chapter number 1, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. I wonder if that was why, Brother Payne, whenever the decree came out where they, could only, they couldn't pray to the one true God, that he kept his windows open and he kept praying to the one true God. I wonder if it was because his walk with God, he didn't take flippantly. I wonder if it's because he took his walk with God seriously. He took his, his being there in a foreign land, but being a Christian, being a servant of the one true God, he took it seriously. And we ought to as well. The purpose. It was a place tree, number one. But number two, I see it was a permanent tree. Look down, if you will, not only was it placed there, for he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river. Oh, I like this. I like this. Not only was the tree placed, but it was a permanent tree. You know what I see here? I see roots. I see a root system that goes straight down. A root system that connects over to the water supply. A root system that's plugged directly into what it needs for nutrients. It wasn't just sitting around. It wasn't just hanging around because it had nothing better to do. It said, I found a good place, and I'm staying right there. That happens when you find something good, by the way. You find something good, you say, I'm, st I'm staying here no matter what happens. If I, find, if I find a place, Brother Payne, where I could go every single week and they were giving out free money, guess what? I'd be there every single week to get that free money. If I knew that there was something good there, you wouldn't have to coax me into it. You wouldn't have to try to convince me. Oh, well, you, you know what? You know what? If, I, if I give you like, some free food, would you go over there and get the money from that free No, no, no. No, you'd be over there every single week. You'd be the first one in line to that place. You wanted to get exactly what they had. But can I tell you that we have a river just like that tree had a river. We can tap in to the power from God's word. We can tap in to the power that God has for us in his word and through our Christian life but only if you put your roots down. You see, this Christian life thing, it's not just a sometimes activity. I hate to break it to you, but you're a Christian in church and when you go home. I don't know if someone broke that news to you, so I'll let you in easy. You're a Christian tomorrow morning too. You're, you're a Christian tomorrow night. You're a Christian on, on Friday. You're a Christian on Saturday. Not just to be a part-time, but a full-time. God said that this is, this is not just a, a, a sometimes gig. This is your life, and this is your reasonable service. And he has that purpose, but he desires you to be a permanent tree, a permanent Christian. You know what I see with Christians now? Not everyone, but some. Brother Ralph, you know what I see? I see Christians that settle near the river rather than putting their roots down. They'll, they'll come over and, and, and live as gypsies over here for a little bit. They'll come over here and, and sojourn near the river. But whenever times get tough, or whenever things look a little bit more attractive over there away from the river, they pack up their bags and they're gone away from the river. Oh, they, they look like they're having a lot more fun over there in the desert. The parties look like they're a little bit more enjoyable over in the desert. Young people, the world will say, hey, you can have no fun. You're so constrained there by the river. So constrained in your Christian life. You can't do this. You have to do this. You have to be here. You can't be there. You're so constrained over there. Look at the parties over here in the wilderness. Look at the parties over here in the desert. They're way more fun. And of course, they don't tell you, show you the people that ruin their lives from drug abuse. They don't show you the person puking in the toilet the next morning. The person waking up hung over the next morning. They won't show you that because they don't want you to see that part. They just want you to see what, what they have is better than what you have. And it's a bold-faced lie. The world has nothing to offer you. Many of you know. You've lived out in the world. You've, you've known. By your experience, you can say the world has nothing to offer. 
Nothing of, long, uh, nothing of longevity. Nothing of what truly matters. No treasures that are going to be laid up in heaven are made in the world. Only in service of God. But I see it was a permanent tree. Which means long term. So often Christians will dabble in a relationship with God for little bits. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll read my Bible for this week. I'll, I'll, I'll pray, but not, not for the entire year, not for the entire month. I'll go to church, but if there's something more important that comes up, whoosh, uprooted and planted somewhere else. That's not the Christian life that God desires for you. That's not the victorious Christian life that God desires for any of us. It was a permanent tree. What does God require of us then, Brother Caleb? You're telling what he, what he doesn't require of, of people getting up and, and just moving or, or replanting the tree elsewhere? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know what God says? Yeah, let the world talk. Let them, let them talk about all the fun they're having over in the desert, but their labor's in vain. Their labor is just wasting their time. Your labor means something. Your, le your labor has eternal value. And you're going to get to heaven one day, and you're going to look over the life that you've lived. The Bible talks about treasures that we lay up in heaven. And some people will get to heaven and, and by all means, they'll, they'll, they'll trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. They'll get there. But because of the life they lived, they'll have nothing to offer. No crowns to put back at the Savior's feet. But to those of us who spend time planted, letting our roots down by the river, we're going to have crowns to give back to Him. Oh, when we get to heaven, we're going to wish we've given Him more. But because it was permanent, it spread out the roots by the river. So we see, number one, yes, it was, it was a place tree. It was a permanent tree. But number three, let me say this, it was a prosperous tree. Go down a little further. It was planted by, by the, uh, the, spread out her root by, roots by the river. And shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green. Originally, I was thinking of this thought for titling the message, What color are your leaves? Because the green leaves are a very important part of it. You see, the green leaves mean that the tree is healthy and vibrant and, and just absolutely thriving. It means it's going to be a fruitful tree. It's a healthy tree. It's a tree that will be good long term because it has the nutrition that it needs. But the trees are also a message to people passing by. Did you realize that when Jesus came to the fig tree... Over in Matthew 21, the, he looked at that fig tree, and the first thing he noticed were the leaves. He saw that the leaves were green. The, it looked like it was a perfectly good fig tree. And the first thing that he saw, it wasn't the fruit, it wasn't the roots, it was the leaves. Did you know that we're living in a lost and dying world? We're living in a world full of people in the wilderness, passing by our doorstep, passing by our river, and looking at our tree. Let me ask you, Christian, what color are your leaves? They look at your life in the, in the middle of a COVID pandemic and they see you, you profess to be a Christian. You say, you go to church, you take your relationship with God seriously. And then they hear you complaining all the time. And then they, they, they see you, they catch you lying or stealing at work. You know what they're seeing? They're seeing those leaves getting all shriveled up. They're saying, what you have by the river, I have over here in the wilderness. You know you're, what you're showing me? I have that right over here. They don't see the roots that are planted down. They don't see the nutrition you're getting from the river. They just see what they already have. And if they're seeing what you, they already have in you, why would they want it? It's a convicting thought. It's a humbling thought. But the leaves were green. You know what it was saying? Saying, you know what? I'm not ashamed to be over here by this river. I'm, 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 very happy to show you exactly what Christ is doing in my life. You know, in the middle of this year, in the middle of this pandemic, people need to see true Christians. Not just Christians that put on their best act on a Sunday or best act on a Wednesday, but Christians that are the same way at church as they are at the house. I'm talking about a prosperous tree. This tree wasn't just surviving. 
it was thriving. And when the heat is turned up, some Christians just settle for getting by. Oh, they got a little bit too hot. You know what? I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm just going to I'm just going to keep my head down and get through this. Have you ever thought that that might not be what God wants for you? Because there's a lost and dying world that's watching you. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I think about those those three boys in a far land along with Daniel. They were put in a situation where they had the purpose in their hearts as well. And there came a time where they were required to bow down to a false idol. They could have easily said, you know what, it's a tough time. It's a hard land. This isn't home. No one else would know. Our parents are gone. Our preacher is gone. Everyone who knows us back in, 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 in Jerusalem and Israel is gone. They would have no clue. If we just bowed down, we could just keep our head down and ride this out. But that's not what they chose to do. They realized that keeping their head down would cause more harm than good. And they didn't know what would happen. You couldn't tell me right from the beginning that they knew exactly how God was going to intervene, how God was going to save them. But the heat was turned up, figuratively and literally, seven times hotter. Said, because you didn't bow down, because you didn't keep your head down and just go with the flow like we wanted you to, we're going to throw you into a burning, fiery furnace. And before we do, we're going to turn the heat up seven times hotter. But because they didn't keep their head down, because they kept their head up and kept their leaves green, Jesus goes up in heaven saying, you know what? That looks like fun down there. I see revival starting to break out in that fire. You know what? But you know what? You know what, Father? Let me just go down. Let me just go down and, and let's have some revival with them for a little bit. They're not ashamed of my name. They're not ashamed to be standing up for what's right. And went down and was in the midst of that fire with them. I'm saying, God might not want you in the hard times to keep your head down. He might want you to keep your head up. You see, if you keep your head down, you just want to get through. But if you keep your head up, God might want to work through. You see, there's a very interesting thing here. If they would have just gone with the flow, then the entire nation of Babylon would have been stuck in their idolatrous ways. It was because they took a stand, because they weren't ashamed, and because they stood up for what was right, the entire nation turned to the one true God. Say, Brother Caleb, it's, it's a pandemic. It's, 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 it's a very uncomfortable year. I, I, I've lost my job. I've lost such and such. I, I've, I've had so many inconveniences in my life. And I sympathize with you. That's, that, that's terrible. But don't stop being a Christian just because of the circumstances. If we let the circumstances dictate our Christianity, it is not true Christianity. Our Christianity is not based on our circumstances. It's based on our Savior and His love for us. That's what we have to focus on. That's what we have to focus on. So we see it was a permanent tree. It was a prosperous tree. Fourthly, let me say this. It was a prepared tree. I like this. The Bible says that her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Not careful in the year of drought. I think about that. In the Bible, you read about famines and droughts almost all the time. Times where there was no water in the land, no food in the land. And I began to think about the benefits of being by the river in the middle of a drought. You're right near the only place to get water. You're right near the only place where you're going to be sustained. All those, those heaths over there in the wilderness, they're just tumbleweeds at this point rolling across the desert. But you're still fine because of where you were planted. I thought about that. Planting that tree right there took a little bit of preparation. It took a little bit of foreknowledge, thinking if something bad happens, I want to be close to the source of my nutrition. Amen. Oh, Christian, can I say that in a spiritual sense? When something bad happens, oh, you need to be prepared. I'm talking about Christians that know their Bible so that when something bad happens or they get challenged on their faith, they can take to a chapter and verse. I'm talking about a Christian when something bad happens, they have a relationship with God where their faith is not shaken, their faith and trust is not broken, they still have their ultimate confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Why? Because of anything that they've done? No, because of everything he's done. They know exactly who their confidence is in. Why? It was a prepared tree. 
It was a prepared tree. All the trees over in the wilderness weren't ready for the drought. Can I tell you that in the middle of this pandemic, I think there were a lot of Christians that weren't ready for the drought either. We had to go eight weeks, I believe. Was it eight weeks? Where we did not have church in the church building. Eight weeks of drought, if you will. Oh, we still had live stream services. Oh, we still had something throughout the weeks. But it wasn't the same. And it was sad to see many people in the midst of the drought uproot themselves from the river and plant themselves in the wilderness. Pastors mentioned it several times. It doesn't make any sense. Why in a time of famine would you leave the one source of your nutrition? Why in the time when things get tough would you leave the one place where you'll be satisfied? As Christians, it's so important that we be plugged in to the word of God. Plugged into the place of God. Plugged into the place of our spiritual nutrition. Can I tell you this? We may not have seen the worst of 2020. We may not have seen the worst in this country or of our church or religious persecution yet. There may be things far worse in our future. We do not know. But can I tell you this? The time is now to get prepared for them. Oh, it's too late once the bad things come to say, oh, well, now I'm going to get prepared. Now I'm going to go get ready. Now I'm going to take my prayer life seriously or my walk with God seriously. By the time that the, the, the drought or the famine comes, it is too late to prepare. At that point, you're just getting through. But can I tell you this? We have a time now in America when we're still having religious freedoms. We still have the, the, the privilege and the honor to meet here in Calvary Baptist Church, to take our walk with God seriously, to take our prayer life seriously. Christians, don't squander this opportunity. Don't squander the opportunity to prepare. When bad times come, you're not going to be prepared if you're living in sin. When bad times come, you're not going to be prepared if you're walking apart from God. When bad times come, you're not going to be prepared if you're focused more on the carnal of this world than the spiritual of heaven. It's time to be prepared. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2 says, If ye then be with, risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know how you get prepared? Start looking toward heaven. It's amazing how your entire life changes when your perspective turns back on heaven. When you start thinking that one day you're going to be walking on those streets of gold. If you're saved tonight, if you know Jesus is your Savior and, and heaven is your home, one day you will be walking on those streets of gold. You'll be seeing those gates of pearl. You'll be looking at your own mansion. But not only that, you'll be seeing the faces of those in heaven as well. You'll be seeing all those around you. And if you can look at the people around you in Dundalk, in Baltimore, through the sight of, are they going to heaven or are they going to hell? It will change the way you live. It will change the way you act. It will change the way you think. It will change the way you talk. Why? Because you're preparing. Not for this temporary time, but for an eternal time in heaven. And lastly... We see it was a place tree. It was a permanent tree. It was a prosperous tree. It was a prepared tree. But lastly, it was a productive tree. The person who planted this tree didn't just do it so that there would be a pretty tree to look at. He didn't just do it so that because he had nothing better to do. I just want to plant a tree, and if it grows awesome, that's the end of the story. No, 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 no. The purpose of every tree is the same, and that is to bear fruit. A tree that doesn't bear fruit is only good for firewood. It's only good to be chopped down. If I planted an apple tree, I would expect apples. If it did not bear apples, I would chop it down and start over again. Because I expect the fruits from the tree. And if I get this analogy right, the tree is supposed to be the blessed man, the man who places his trust in the Lord, the believer, if you will. And if we're a tree, where's our fruit? If you're a tree, where's your fruit? I see a, a, a beautiful tree planted by the water to the right place. It's at the right time. It was prepared. It was prosperous. It was permanent. 
But the purpose of it was to bear fruit. If the tree doesn't bear fruit, it was not a productive tree. I see this tree even in the midst of the drought, even in the midst of the heat, even in the inconvenient times, come what may, it still bear fruit. Can I tell you, friends, Christians, 2020 is not an excuse to stop bearing fruit. 2020 is not an excuse to stop winning souls. 2020 is not an excuse to take your foot off the gas and just to ride the brake. It's a time that God wants to use to keep our head up so that he can work in and through every opportunity. But often, we see problems as just a time where we can coast. Oh, we don't have the same opportunities we used to, so you know what, we'll just have to, we'll just have to stop doing those things. Let's not get creative with the way that we soul win. Let's not get creative with the way that we outreach. Let's just ride the brakes. Let's just, let's just coast till Jesus comes. You know what that is? That's a fig tree with green leaves and no fruit. No telling what God wants to do in and through 2020. There's no telling who's out there because of 2020 who's searching for answers, who's searching for the truth, who's searching for what you already have, and if you're silent, how will they ever hear? The time where they need Christians the most is now. The time when the world needs us now, most is now. The time where Dundalk needs Calvary Baptist Church to be faithful in soul winning and reaching our communities is now. Not next year. Not waiting. Not keeping our heads down. But going out and bearing much fruit. One more passage and I'm done. The Bible says in Mark chapter 15... Or 16, verse 15, it says, And he saith unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He continues to go on in John 15 to say, Herein is my Father glorified, glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. God's plan for you teenagers, bear much fruit. God's plan for you moms and dads, bear much fruit. God's plan for everyone in this building is to bear much fruit. If we're not bearing fruit, we're not being a productive tree. So, Billy Caleb, why are you saying this? Well, it's been a crazy year. We never could have, we never could have predicted this. But come what may, are we going to be a tree that's going to stand? Are we going to be a tree that uproots ourselves and just moves away when times get tough? Are we going to be a fruitful tree? Are we going to be a prepared tree? Are we going to be prosperous? The choice is up to you. Heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. The altar's open. If God's dealing with your heart, come and do business with him tonight.